In this video, we take a trip to the continent of Essos to explore the costumes of the East from the HBO series Game of Thrones, coming up. Welcome back to another episode of Costume Co. Each week, I analyze the costumes of some of your favorite shows and movies. If this is something that interests you, consider subscribing and hitting the bell notification icon so you don't miss anything. I'm looking at the costumes of Essos in no particular order in what might be a three or a four parter. In this episode, I look at the costumes of Bravos, Volantis, and Pentos. Before we get to that, I want to share with you some of my viewers' Game of Thrones-inspired costumes. First up is India Mays. She sent me these pictures of her Daenerys-themed graduation gown back in August, and somehow I missed including them in my summer recap videos. This costume is made 100% by India, and she did it over a span of about five days. She even included this Targaryen-themed graduation program, so I'll leave her process in the description below if you want to check it out. Layla Cruzite sent me this reproduction of Sansa's wedding gown, the one that she wore in her marriage to Tyrion. The construction on this is amazing, and Layla found such a close fabric to the original, but she said that the fabric was curtain fabric and a little difficult to work with. And I'll tell you, I've used curtain fabric myself on many projects, and it can sometimes be difficult, especially if the fabric is synthetic. Here are a few close-ups of the embroidery. She tells me that she did some of the embroidery by machine, and the rest was all done by hand. And finally, I have this submission from Tatiana Melendez. Tatiana is a talented illustrator and designer, and I'm always thrilled to get her submissions. This first costume is a design for Cersei that she has an idea for in season eight. These two pictures seen here are of Lyanna Stark. The first one on the left is a dress that she would have worn at the tourney in Heron Hall, or what she might have worn when she escaped with Rhaegar. The costume on the right is of Lyanna wearing her version of Stark armor. And I'll leave all of Tatiana's details in the description below so that you can learn more about her designs and what fabrics, colors, and trims she would use. Thanks again to India, Layla, and Tatiana for sharing your work with us. I have more Game of Thrones submissions coming up in the next episode. And if you'd like to share your art, I'll leave my email address below. Costume designer Michelle Clapton has said very little about Essos and what her inspirations for these costumes are. And I should also add that April Ferry replaced Michelle Clapton in season six when she had to go off and work on The Crown. Clapton did establish the looks for all of the regions, but nonetheless, some of the costumes are the work of April Ferry. I've had to piece together what I can from Wikia and bits of things that I found online, along with my own observations to put this presentation together. So I look forward to hearing your thoughts as well. So if you'd like to add something, you can leave a comment below. And as always, there will be spoilers for the entire seven seasons of Game of Thrones. The free cities are nine independent city-states that occupy the western end of the massive eastern continent of Essos and are engaged in extensive trade contact with the Seven Kingdoms. And heads up, I will likely get some of the names wrong, so before you go on attack mode, keep in mind that these are invented names from an invented language from the mind of an author, George R. R. Martin. Volantis is one of the free cities located to the east of Westeros. According to Jorah Mormont, Volantis is the oldest, the first colony of Valyria. Boliko Pinimian is a prominent noble and slave trader of Volantis. In his parley with Tyrion and Varys, he acts as a representative of the Triarchs of Volantis, the three elected rulers. To me, his costume looks Asian-inspired, but with a medieval twist. What's unique about his and other Volantis nobles is this pleated obi belt. This woman here, I think, is a female noble or higher-born woman. Talisa Stark was a higher-born citizen of Volantis before relocating to Westeros to become a healer. Her gown also has a slightly Asian look to it. 
While it is simple, it appears to be very good quality. The gown itself looks like it's made from silk and the robe is fully lined. This woman, meanwhile, is a slave. Slaves make up the majority of the Volantis population with five slaves to every one noble-born person. This type of slave collar is akin to the collars worn by the slaves of Marine, Astapor, and Yunkai. This makes sense since many of the slaves in Volantis funnel out into the greater slaver cities. Lengths of cloth are woven through the ring on their slave collars, wrapped about the body and knotted in a variety of ways. In behind these slaves, we see a nobleman dressed just like Boliko. Here's a close-up of one of the slaves. This slave also has a tattoo on his cheek, and the tattoo prevents escaping on the constant flow of ships and also indicates what role he has. His circle within a circle indicates that he's a cart driver. This slave, meanwhile, has a fly on his cheek, which indicates a dung shoveler. Clea is a bed slave in a Volantis brothel. While she doesn't wear a slave collar, we know that she is one because of the tattoo on her cheek. Bed slaves are tattooed with a triangle that's supposed to be an abstracted tear. Michelle Clapton's original design for the Danny lookalike in the Volantis brothel also had the front of her dress cut out to mirror the exposed back of the skirt, but showrunners David and Dan requested that they change it so that it would be less shocking. Pentos is one of the free cities located on the western coastline of Essos, across the narrow sea from Westeros. It is a large, rich city-state of merchant lords. Michelle Clapton says of Daenerys' Pentoshi-style costume from season one, Daenerys starts as this very innocent, beautiful young girl, and I just wanted a real elegance of cut and a simplicity. Certainly not medieval, it's almost slightly Grecian, but it's her own particular style. In behind, we catch a brief glimpse of Danny's handmaiden. While slavery is forbidden by law in Pentos, some magistrates like Illyrio, who has his finger in the slave trade, float such laws with slaves dressed in bronze collars. Illyrio is a merchant prince and a magister dressed like all of the other magistrates. He wears a voluminous, terracotta-colored sleeveless surcoat with a built-in, fully-lined cape. The jacquard tunic is fastened at the front with a row of round brass buttons, and he's ornamented with rings on his fingers and bells in his braided beard and a Moroccan-style belt with each link enameled with a colorful motif and ornamented with tiny brass beads. In this scene, you can see that all of the magistrates wear nearly identical tunics to Illyrio. In the foreground stands a Pentoshi guard wearing little more than a pleated skirt and pith-style helmet. Their weapons are Spartan-style shields and spears. While being harbored by Illyrio and Pentos, Varys and Tyrion wear gold-colored sleeveless surcoats. Varys has a damask-style print, while Tyrion's is more geometric. Varys' surcoat is cut in the same style as Illyrio's, with the button front and cape, while Tyrion's vest is gathered into a series of pleats in the front and back. Both of them wear the muslin undershirts. Varys wears these fun leather turned up shoes. In this shot, we get a good look at the partially sewn pleats on Tyrion's tunic. Bravos is the northernmost, the richest, and arguably the most powerful of the free cities. The harbor entrance is guarded by the Titan of Bravos, a 400-foot statue dressed in Greek hoplite-style armor. And I haven't read the book, so I'm not sure what the historical significance of this Greek-style costume is. Tycho Nestoris is an employee of the Iron Bank of Bravos, the largest bank in the Game of Thrones world. Tycho dresses like all of the bankers in a crop-style silk doublet, rough, and pleated skirt. The doublet has these bands in the front and back, and you'll notice that this detail, which looks a bit like suspenders, is on many of the doublets of the citizens. One odd bit that I'm not sure what the significance of is this rope of braided hair that looks more human than animal. Showrunner D.B. Weiss stated, 
From the moment we read about the Iron Bank and Tycho Nestoris, the representative of the Iron Bank, we loved it because it was such an atypical element. Banking doesn't really factor into most high fantasy, but it's very modern. I mean, the lines are very clean and Dutch Protestant, and the way they dress is inspired by the Dutch Golden Age. And they're a bit more advanced than most of the people in Westeros, which is perhaps why they're in charge of everything. Michelle Clapton said, I quite like the idea that banking is a dirty business. Once they come into the bank, they put the sabo on because it's where they're working. And the men are in these very pleated skirts and metallic ruffs. Here's a shot of the jacket taken from Michelle Carragher's site. I looked at this costume back in November when Nestor showed up in King's Landing to collect his gold. So at the time, I mentioned that this type of decorative corded quilting is also called Italian quilting, and it gives the doublet this three-dimensional effect. The effect is achieved by creating channels between two pieces of fabric for which the cord is woven through, like in the sample that we see on the left. This embroidery technique differs from couching, as we see on the right, which is where the cord is applied on top of the fabric. The ruffs worn by the bankers and many of the bravassi were created by Aransa Villas from Panaki Studios in southeast London. And with permission, I am delighted to be able to share with you these images. According to their website, it states that they produced 60 meters of rusted silk, 30 meters which were also distressed, and 12 meters of the distressed silk was made into panels for the ruffs. The molds were created specifically for these ruffs made from special parchment paper that is drawn, scored, and folded by hand. The fabrics were then placed in the molds and pleated, with each length becoming one third of each ruff. These panels were then given to the amazing makers in the workroom who constructed the finished ruffs. In the end, they went with two designs, the diamond and the double diamond pleats. So to learn more about Panaki Studios and this amazing technique, I'll leave a link in the description below. Jack and Hagar is just an assumed identity of one of the faceless men of Bravas, a feared order of mysterious assassins with the ability to change their appearance at will. Jacken's costume is a utilitarian style hooded robe, akin to that of a Jedi master. It is very modeled and distressed, giving it an aged, lived in look. Pretty much every costume in Bravas looks like it's been dipped in a dye bath. According to the Blu-ray extras, the texture of the costume worn in the House of Black and White are designed to echo the textures of the building's walls. The robe is assembled with, a wide, with wide strips of linen or heavy cotton, and I suppose it's possible that the garments of the faceless men and women are assembled from the remnants of the dead that make up the Hall of Faces. Jacken wears a leather belt fastened in a knotted style on the left side, like we see on almost every citizen in Westeros and Essos. And it's hard to tell, but he's wearing a tunic or shift under the robe. And in this shot, you can see that he's wearing leather Grecian style sandals. Of course, Jacken's telltale feature is his long red hair with a shock of white hair streak. According to Michelle Clapton, the flap of fabric on the costume was designed so that he could put it over his face when dealing with dead bodies, also reflecting his use of disguises as the faceless man. Here's the Waif's principal costume. It's just a simple shift with a brown leather belt. It's a simpler version of Jacken's robe in this charcoal black color, although it also has that same flap, and she wears a muslin shift underneath. And here's the same costume on display. The waif wears this bravassi peasant style costume while in disguise as an old woman in an attempt to murder Arya. The costume is comprised of a brocade crop jacket with bell sleeves and a fan sunburst pleated skirt that's made from a print fabric. The muslin blouse has bishop sleeves and the costume has been distressed. And I think it's likely that while there may be some glamour happening with the disguises, it's also likely that the faceless men have a large wardrobe full of clothing at their disposal from all of the people that the faceless men have gifted death to. I love the Waif's costume and it's a good counterpart to Arya's own masculine costume. 
Arya's costume is nearly identical to the Waith, although it looks like it has more shaping. Michelle Clapton says, unlike Sansa, who chooses to change and express herself, Arya just adopts costumes to the situation or place she's in. It's not about Arya, it's about the person she's playing. And as a side note, actor Maisie Williams was allowed to throw her old costume in the river. You know, the boy costume that she wore in season four. But it was later fetched out so that it could be used in exhibition, even though there were actually multiples of the same costume. From this angle, you can see that the dress has quite a bit of fullness, blousing out over her belt. Like the waif, Arya wears a shift underneath her dress. Here's a close-up of the structure of the dress. While it's a very simple design, the top and skirt are made up of wide strips of cotton, and then the whole thing is broken down. This is one of Arya's under tunics. As you can see, it's pretty much a shapeless garment, except for a bit of pleating at the shoulders, and then the whole thing is dipped and broken down. Michelle Clapton said of Arya's street vendor costume, it's inspired a bit by Russian costumes with fabric made to look like filigreed copper. The skirt has two layers with a slightly frayed unfinished hem. From this Entertainment Weekly photo shoot, Arya's wearing a bolero style jacket, cotton blouse, pleated skirt with a shawl, belt and pouch and leather gloves. You can see how much fullness there is in the skirt. Here is Michelle Clapton's original sketch for Arya's costume, taken from Entertainment Weekly, and her costume on display at the Game of Thrones exhibit. According to the sketch, Clapton had originally intended for Arya's jacket to be this oxidized green copper, but changed it to the gold color seen on the right. The skirt on display is very crushed, and that's possibly from storage, and not how it looked in the show. In this image, Arya wears a sunburst pleated skirt. This is a common garment worn by both men and women in Bravas, most notably the bankers. She tops off the skirt with a macrame shawl. Macrame is a form of textile produced using a knotting technique in a variety of ways, including shawls, window treatments, handbags, and wall decor. The word macrame comes from the Arabic word migrama, meaning fringe, although it is also associated with the Turks. One of the earliest recorded uses of macrame style knots as decoration appeared in the carvings of the Babylonians and Assyrians, and sailors used macrame to create hammocks and other useful items as a way to pass the time while at sea. Materials used in macrame include cords made from a cotton twine, linen, hemp, jute, leather, or yarn. And for fun, I thought I'd throw in these pictures of this Dior silk evening dress from John Galliano's 2002-2003 collection. According to the Met where this dress is housed, in his use of tie-dye and macrame effects, Galliano clearly alludes to 1967 and the summer of love. In this close-up, Arya styles her hair like many of the women and girls in Bravos, starting with the severe center part the two sections are braided toward the front and finished off with a bun on each side. Her hair is decorated with what looks like leather, although they could be metal cutouts of flowers and leaves. One of the most interesting aspects of Arya's costume is this doublet-like jacket. It's comprised of two layers. The base is a brocade and the top layer looks like a macrame lace overlay. Once the pieces are attached, Usually with a process like flat basting, they are treated and sewn as one piece. Here's a diagram of how two pieces of fabric are hand basted together before the garments are sewn. The bodice and wings are created as one piece while the sleeves are detachable, like her jackets that we see in season seven. In this close-up, you can see the heavy distressing done on the textile. This might have been done with dye, but it also looks like paint might have been applied after the jacket was constructed. And they've added this rough cloth scarf. It looks a bit like boiled wool or linen. Here are a few examples of macrame textiles. Since macrame is often made from natural fibers like silk, cotton, or linen, it takes dye very well. In this close-up, you can see that Arya's leather gloves have this fine nail detail on the palms. Maisie Williams wore these gloves to protect her hands from the sharp shells when oyster shucking. What can I say about Arya's rags? Rags seem to look the same no matter where you go in Westeros or Essos. Heavy and coarse textiles, heavily distressed and frayed. 
And I thought I'd add that Aria, I believe, is wearing the same sandals from the House of Black and White. In Aria's attempt to fit in, she returns to dressing like a boy as a way to blend in. She achieves this by wearing her hair down like the men do, at least the ones with shoulder length hair, and wearing a jerkin, poet shirt, and trunk hose made from homespun fabrics. Her outfit is nearly identical to the man on the left, except that he wears leg wraps and shoes instead of slouchy boots. Frank Gilgler, executive producer of Game of Thrones, said, Once we decided we were using the Netherlands in the 16th and 17th century as the model for the buildings of Bravos, Michelle then picked up on that and designed the costumes for Bravos along the same lines. The citizens of Bravos wear an assortment of Renaissance garments. The men tend to wear either a short doublet-like jacket or jerkin, often with crescent-shaped cap sleeves on the top and trunk hose or galley gaskins, which are uh, loose-style trousers, but sometimes a pleated skirt like we see on the bankers. And the women wear fitted bodices very similar to the men and mid-calf length pleated or gathered skirts. Most of the clothing are in earth tones, depending on their trade, that are tinted with pigment like umber, ochre, and sienna. Notice that the odd person wears a basket on their heads. Dutch painters like Vermeer used vivid colors, like in this oil on canvas of, of the Milkmaid from 1660, where he incorporated ultramarine blue and matter lake. And if you saw my Viking exhibit video, you might remember that matter is the red pigment that comes from the root of a plant. In this crowd scene from the play, you can see a variety of colors, including Tyrian purples. Yes, that's actually the name, Prussian blues and greens. These beautifully embroidered collars are the work of principal embroidery artist Michelle Carragher. When I first came across these images, I had no idea where they were placed in the show. I actually had to search them out to discover they were used intermittently on the background players in the crowd scenes. In a way, they're sort of like an underproper for the ruff, which is a collar that was popular during the Elizabethan period. Have to look really closely, but here are a few men and women wearing them in the crowd scenes. Here's a behind the scenes shot of two background players. The colors and fabrications are so much more vivid under normal lighting, but what I love most is that you can actually see their shoes. They look like characters out of a Brothers Grimm fairy tale. In this image that features the waif, the textured dyeing of the clothing is much more obvious, especially on the women's skirts. Many of the citizens wear the pleated ruffs, while some of the men and women wear a neck scarf or tie out of rough cloth around their neck or even on their head. All of the top and bottom garments are fastened with laces. In season six, Arya is tasked with an assassination of the mummer Lady Crane. Part of Arya's research is to watch the Bravasi theater troupe The Gate put on a production of The Bloody Hand. The play shows a comedic take on the War of the Five Kings and is produced in the style of Shakespeare's comedies with its farcical telling of real-life characters. And while not the case in Essos, it's interesting to note that in Shakespeare's time, the characters of men and women were portrayed by men. Having worked in theater, I can tell you that the costume department often has limited resources, which is why thespians often use the idiom, beg, borrow, or steal. Like carnival costumes, embellishments might be found objects like the bell seen on both Bianca Sansa character and the Lannister guards costume. My thoughts are that the costumes for the play within a play scene are slightly off. You know, they're not really the fashions of either Bravas or King's Landing. There's something medieval renaissance that's influenced them for sure. But some items we have even yet to see in this world, like Joffrey's codpiece and Cersei's gown with dags, which is worn by Lady Crane. During the Renaissance, it would not be uncommon for costumes to be used in multiple productions, sometimes taken apart, altered, and put back together in another way. As well, during that time, historical accuracy wasn't as important as it is today. As well, while the troupe might have the luxury of a wardrobe mistress, the actors would often be responsible for the maintenance and repair of their own costumes and wigs. 
Isambaro, being the impresario and writer for The Gate, like Shakespeare, casts himself in the lead male roles like the king. He also has one of the best costumes as well. Here, he is portraying Robert Baratheon. And it's difficult to know how citizens of Bravos would know exactly how the royal family of King's Landing would look and dress. It's possible that there are portraits. For instance, in Zambaro, seems to know that Robert has a beard and gray hair and that he's heavy set. And finally, I thought I'd include that Cyril Farrell, Arya's fencing teacher, is originally from Bravos, where he spent nine years as the first sword of the city. Bravasi's sword fighters don't wear armor, but Sirio's jerkin does have some padding and the addition of a skirt, which would protect his hips from the blade. Otherwise, his clothing is typical of other Bravasi citizens. And that concludes this episode of The Costumes of Essos. Make sure to check out part two, where we'll look at the costumes of Astapor, Yunkai, and Marine. And if you want to be notified about the next video, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification icon so you don't miss a thing. And I'm now on Facebook too, so if you want to find me there, I'll leave a link in the description below. As always, thank you so much for watching.